There are a whole bunch of terms and processes and approaches in the L&D world that we all accept, that we all use, that we all talk about, but sometimes the reasons behind them, the causes of them, the kind of why this works piece gets a little bit lost. So I thought I'd take a look at one of those foundational considerations that we all talk about, cognitive load. First up, let's define cognitive load. Simply put, cognitive load is the amount of mental effort required to process information. Now, our brains only have a limited capacity for processing information at any given time. And when that capacity is exceeded, things like learning, and memorization really start to suffer. Now, when we think about this in the context of workplace learning, it's very easy to see the impact this has. If we don't carefully manage the cognitive load of our users during what we consider to be learning or training experiences, then we run the risk of simply putting them through an experience that they're not able to process, that they're not able to take the information or the experience or the considerations we're giving them and convert them to actual learned behaviours. If it's knowledge that we're trying to impart, they may not be able to encode that information sufficiently for it to become memorized. Now, often when we talk about this, we simply say cognitive load as if it's one thing. But in actual fact, within the kind of cognitive load theory or our understanding of cognitive load, there are three main types. The first is intrinsic cognitive load. This is the inherent difficulty of the actual material or concept someone is trying to learn. Now, obviously, you cannot eliminate this kind of load. It's inherently important to what you're trying to do. And this is why a little while ago, if you remember, I spoke about how I'm not a massive fan of learning being easy because this intrinsic load is the process of learning, ultimately. It's the complexity of what you're trying to get your head around. And overcoming that gives the user a real sense of achievement. So we don't want to take it away, even if we could. What we do want to do, though, is manage it. The main way we do that is, again, probably one of the most foundational things instructional designers learn, chunking. We break down large, complex concepts or pieces of information into smaller, more manageable pieces. This might be all delivered in the same modality, but in different sections. This might be split up further. This might be a syllabus rather than a single module, or it might be multiple syllabuses across multiple courses. The important thing is that we recognize that we cannot remove intrinsic cognitive load, but we can manage it by breaking content up. Next up, we have extraneous cognitive load. This is the additional load created by your chosen modality, by the way you present the information or the experience or the training materials. This is where really the world of UX and UI can lend us so much help. This is about making sure that your user isn't expending energy and mental effort trying to figure out how your menu system works rather than focusing on the content you want them learning. This is why when people talk about aesthetics and learning design, it's not just I want to make it look pretty because that's what I like to do or because I want to show off. Aesthetics matter in that they can help reduce extraneous cognitive load. Now, there is a limit to that and a tipping point where we can very easily focus too much on making things look impressive and grand and actually go from reducing to increasing extraneous load. By putting so much stuff on the screen, it starts to get confusing. Remember, every decision we make in terms of modality, in terms of navigation, in terms of how content is delivered, whether it's digital or human or some combination of the two, is all about helping the learner succeed. If that is not the reason you're adding something, you need to really stop and question yourself hard. Why is this thing being added? If it's just for you, if it's to make yourself look clever 
or to show off or to make it pretty simply for the sake of that, please reconsider. You are doing the exact opposite of what you think you are doing. You are hindering the learner by increasing extraneous load. Finally, we have germane cognitive load. This, to my mind, is by far the most interesting, but probably the one that we focus on the least quite often. This is where all the kind of learning and retaining effort sits. This is the cognitive load that is essential to the real process of learning. This is perhaps where we have to do the least management because this is really all coming down to the balance of the previous two. The intrinsic load of the content itself, how difficult a subject is or how complex a concept may be to wrap your head around, and the extraneous load of how it's being delivered. When we get the balance right, using chunking, using good UI and UX standards, and everything else we do as instructional designers, the germane cognitive load remains in balance. Our users are able to learn, memorize, develop new behaviors, or come up with new systems, synthesize new information based on what we're giving them and their existing understanding. It's all about balance, not just about reduction which so often is what we hear about cognitive load. We so often hear it reduces cognitive load and that's a massive oversimplification and quite often simply not accurate. You might say I'm looking to reduce the extraneous load in order to balance a higher intrinsic load of this complex topic, but you're not just reducing cognitive load. Be specific in how you talk about these kinds of topics. It's important not only because it shows our expertise and when so often we're kind of crying as an industry that we're not taken seriously, we're not given a seat around the table, people don't think we know what we're talking about, well then we better make sure that we do know what we're talking about and that we're talking about it in a sensible way. So based on all this, it's pretty obvious how important managing cognitive load is. Now, there are an untold number of ways you can do this, and ultimately, it is all about context. It's about delivering the right material in the right quantities, at the right time, at the right pace, to the right audience, with the right modality and the right design. There are almost too many variables to list in this video. But what I have done is come up with five considerations that I think are always worth considering that spread across modality and delivery style to help give you an idea of simple ways you can manage and adjust the levels of cognitive load in the content you're creating. First and foremost is consider your use of multimedia elements. Now, often when we talk about multimedia, everyone jumps to video or animation, but this could be audio. Multimedia could equally be your use of images and text and how they're combined. It could be the kind of things you put into an interaction whilst not being the interaction itself. The important thing is to consider the flow of the piece. Where are you increasing and where are you reducing the amount of reading your audience is having to do? And what does your audience think? of reading. Some audiences want nothing more than to sit down with 16 pages of PDF text and to read through them at their own pace. For other audience, that will sound like a hellscape of a learning scenario and instead they'd prefer a video or an audio summary or one of these other things. To my mind, when we think about multimedia and cognitive load, I actually start thinking about learning clusters and alternative delivery methods so that people have an option to choose when they want to use a video or an animation or audio to learn, when they just want to read and when they want some kind of mix. The second thing is our good old favorite chunking. We mentioned it before and it's super simple, but it is so often overlooked. Its simplicity is its strength. Break down big pieces of information. Break down complex topics to smaller, easier to manage, easier to understand, and easier to deliver materials. This can help learners in terms of their processing, reduce the intrinsic load, but actually can really help you with managing the design and therefore the extraneous load. When delivering smaller, simpler pieces of information, we tend to create simpler, quicker, 
interactions or pieces of content or sessions because we're not trying to cram too much into one place. Chunking, to my mind, is one of the great superpowers of instructional design. It's simple, it's fairly easy to do, and when used correctly, it makes the world of difference. When it comes to face-to-face -face sessions, there always was the accusation of they're not very time efficient. They're full of breaks and cool down moments and just grabbing a coffee or having some snacks on the table so people can get them when they need them. But actually, those aren't inefficiencies. Those are deliberately placed, or should be deliberately placed, to help manage load across the session. Think about it. If you're in an all-day training session for eight hours, and all you do is go, oh yeah, we're going to stop half an hour in the middle, it doesn't work. Think back to school and hour-long lessons, maybe two of them back-to-back -back before a 15-minute break. How much did you learn in that second lesson? How much did you learn in the second half of the first lesson? Realistically, we as human beings have quite a short span, though it's not perfectly defined, of time where we can work intensely and learn. So, we need to bear that in mind and offer breaks, cooldowns, slow and fast parts of a face-to-face -face training session. And by that I mean, yes, we might do 20 minutes of really intense um, kind of reflection and learning or delivery of fresh content. But then we need to make sure that we go from that very fast, very intense delivery to a period of more relaxed, subtle delivery. Perhaps that is the difference between a very high challenge activity and then a period of reflection and presentation. Maybe it's an actual break. Maybe not after just 20 minutes of content, but maybe if you've just delivered a part of a course that you know is going to be very emotionally impactful. And here I'm thinking about things like all the EDI content that we deliver. Maybe a break is just the best thing to have. An opportunity to step away from the group, not to go, you must now reflect, but to just get away from the whole situation. One of the key skills of a facilitator is being able to spot when the room needs a change, be that a change of pace, a change of content, a change of delivery, or just a change of location in the form of a break. Next up, examples and stories. Now, I don't need to tell the L&D world that storytelling is a powerful tool and scenarios are an effective way of delivering content, but it's really important that we consider that these aren't just tick box exercises. Storytelling is not about characters and humour and themes and pop culture references. Storytelling is about people. It's about personalising a situation or content or information to every person that hears it. Because stories are what bind us all together as the human race. From the day we're born, we're told stories. Stories about ourselves, about our family, about the world in which we live in. Some of them true, some of them false, but all of them important. Because from that collective storytelling, we build our moral background. We form our opinion of other people. We develop a code of ethics internally and as society. From the stories we tell ourselves, we identify ourselves, our group, and the flip side of that is we also identify the other from the stories that we tell. This is a much deeper look at what storytelling really is to the human race than we often bother to take within the world of L&D, but it's vitally important. Otherwise, we're paying lip service to an idea that we're not really utilising. The same is true of scenarios. So often, scenario-based just means, this is happening, what would you do? That's not what a real-world scenario looks like. Real-world scenarios are full of nuance, they're complicated, they break the rules, which is unheard of inside the training world, but that's the reality of doing the job, and if you want your training to be effective, then the scenarios you present and the stories you tell need to be representative of the real world, not some idealised following the rulebook situation. This is where I quite often like to say, when training anything, you want to train the perfect route, the worst case scenario, and something that sits in the middle. 
With that kind of coverage, most people can handle most things. Finally, really consider your use of activities when face-to-face -face and interactive elements when creating digital content. It's not about making everything a click to reveal or making everything need a flip chart or a giant post-it note or working in teams, um, especially not if you're going to do icebreakers. Don't do icebreakers, they're horrible. No one likes them. They kill motivation in the room, just don't. But importantly, you don't want to just present text and images all the time. You don't want to just present videos all the time. You don't want to just present podcasts all the time. You want to be able to present change and variety in a manageable way. When using interactions, they should be obvious. Think about the impact an unclear interaction could have on extraneous cognitive load. Think about the impact a really well-defined interaction, one that we see all the time. Maybe it's just the fact that I can press the burger menu in the corner and get the menu to pop out. Maybe it's just the fact that buttons are clearly labelled. Guess what? If the button's labelled next, I don't need you to say, click the next button to go to the next screen. If something looks like a website, guess what? I'll treat it like a website. I'll scroll down. You don't need to tell me to scroll down. We often go one way or the other in this scenario. We assume our users know everything we know and therefore leave them confused or we treat our users like complete idiots and think they have to be told what a back button looks like. The reality, as always, is somewhere in the middle. Good interactivity, both in terms of digital content and face-to-face -face sessions, all comes down to knowing your audience, conducting user research, running pilot tests, usability studies are all vital to make sure that you're creating a learning experience that works for your people and helps you manage cognitive load. I hope you found this video useful. Please let me know down in the comments if I missed anything, which I almost certainly did. Hit the like button and subscribe. And if you'd like to support us further, you can do so on Patreon for as little as £1 per month.